next paper will be June 2022, P22. Okay, we haven't gone through this paper, so we'll go through this now. Right now, for question one, in the following list, underline all units that are SI base units. So the emphasis here is to identify the SI base units. Okay. Ampere is considered to be an SI base unit because it's for current. Degree Celsius is not an SI base unit. This one should have been Kelvin. So this one is out. Kilogram is an SI base unit. Then Newton is not an SI base unit. Okay. Now, specifically for Newton, okay, force, the unit of force is Newton. But at the same time, it's also kg meter per second squared. This F here is referring to force. Okay. Unit of force is Newton. Unit of force is also kg meter per second squared. If you're talking about Newton being the unit of force, it is correct to say that this one is SI unit of force, but this is the special name given to force. But specifically, if we want SI base units, it will be kg meter per second square. Okay. So sometimes people get confused. New isn't Newton the SI unit of force? That is correct. But here the question is asking the SI base units of force. So it should be kg meter per second square. All right. Now for part B, they mentioned here figure 1.1 1 .1 shows a horizontal beam clamp at one end with a block attached to the other end. The block is made to oscillate vertically. The Young's modulus E on the material is given by this equation. E is equal to km over t square, where m is the mass, t is the period, and k is the constant. The student determines the values and percentage uncertainties of k, m, and t. And the table here is giving you the values of the percentage uncertainties for each of those quantities. From here, the student then, then uses value of k, m, and t to calculate the values of e as this value. Now, calculate the percentage uncertainty in the value of e. So the question here wants you to find out the percentage uncertainty. Okay, so if you are talking about absolute uncertainty, wait, let me just rewrite this. If you are talking about absolute uncertainty, you are looking for delta E. If you are looking at fractional uncertainty, it will be delta E over E. If you're talking about percentage uncertainty, it will be delta E over E times 100%. So here, from fractional to percentage, all you just really need to do is multiply by 100%. The question is asking you to find the percentage uncertainty. Okay, we need to say delta E over E times 100%. Now, from the e given equation here, there's something that you can actually start to work out first. We know that E is actually... Okay, maybe it's better if I just go down a little. Okay, so here, we know the equation already. There's something that we can work out from that equation. If E is... Km over t square, we can change it to fractional uncertainties in this form. Delta E over E is equals to delta K over K plus delta M over M plus two times of delta T over T. Okay. So this is the one thing that we can try to do. This one is still changing it to fractional uncertainty form. Now for our case in the table, we already know the percentage uncertainty. If we were to find out the fractional uncertainty, 
it's really a matter of us dividing by 100%. Because you see just now, if we go from fractional to percentage, is hundred is multiplied by 100%. If we want to go the other way around, going from percentage to fractional, it will just be divide by 100. So here, in terms of our fractional uncertainty, this one k would be 0 0.021. and would be... 0 0.006 and then t will be 0 0.015 okay so that will be our fractional uncertainty here so in my case i can actually just sub everything in k will be 0 0.021 plus uh, then delta m over m will be 0 0.06 0 0.06 and then other than my delta t over t will be two times of 0 0.015 okay so these are all my fractional uncertainties i'm just summing the values in so if i go and add them all up eventually i will get this value just give me a moment while I get my calculator. 0 0.021 plus 0 0.006 plus 2 times of 0 0.015. You will be getting 0 0.057. So therefore, when you're talking about your percentage uncertainty, it's actually times 100%. It should be 5.7%. Okay. That one should be the value of your percentage uncertainty. Right, so let's check the answer. Yes, it is 5.7%. Okay. So this is finding the percentage uncertainty. Then if you move on to the next page. Now the next page is asking you to find the uncertainty again, but this time it's in the form of your absolute uncertainty. Use your answer in B1, the one that you just did, to determine the value of E with its absolute uncertainty to an appropriate number of significant figures, okay? So here the one, your absolute uncertainty. So if you already know that your percentage uncertainty is 5.7%, 5.7%, and we know percentage uncertainty is delta E over E, times 100%, giving you 5.7% here. When we want to find absolute uncertainty, just now, as I mentioned to you, this is really finding delta E. So we want to find this. But luckily for you, they've already actually given you what's the value E itself. So it makes your work of finding delta E very straightforward. This is 8.245 times 10 power 9. So you sub the values in delta E over 8.245 times 10 power 9 equals to 0 0.57. Sorry, 0 0.057. Okay. Because I bring the 100% over to the right side, this is 0 0.057. Okay. My delta E would thus be some value here 0 0.057 times with 8.245 times 10 power 9. You will get it as 0 0.7. So, no, you will get it as 0 0.5 times 10 power 9. Pascal. Okay. Because your original value of E was this, isn't it? 8.245 times 10 power 9. When you find your delta E, you also try to leave it with the same power of 10. Okay. So because the original value of E was 8.245 times 10 power 9, when I find my absolute uncertainty, I also try to leave it in the same form where I have the same power of 10, 10 power 9. Okay. So that's one thing that we will do. Now, they want the value of E with its absolute uncertainty, so our working isn't actually complete. If we want to express E 
if it's absolute uncertainty, it should have been 8.3, sorry, 8.2, not 8.3. It should have been 8.2 plus minus 0 0.5 times 10 power 9 Pascal. So your answer here should have been 8.2 plus minus 0 0.5 times 10 power 9. Okay, now there is a specific format to follow when you express your measured value or calculated value with its absolute uncertainty. So let me try to show you the rules here. When it comes to absolute uncertainty, this one must be 1SF only. For absolute uncertainty, it must be 1SF only. And then after that, your measured value or calculated value must follow the same dp from here to here this one you need to follow the decimal place decimal point sorry so usually what we'll do is that we look at the sf first this is the first one that we'll do absolute uncertainty is at one sf so when you write that one sf notice that it becomes 0 0.5 but this one will now become 1 dp. So when it comes to the measured value or your calculated value, this one, rather than looking at the SF, we need to follow the dp. If this one was at 1 dp, for absolute uncertainty, the measured value or calculated value must also be at 1 dp. Okay, so there are basically these two rules to follow. Look at the SF first, make sure it's 1 SF. For absolute uncertainty, look at the SF first, make sure it's one SF, and then whatever DP you have, make sure it's carried over to your calculated value. That's the second step. All right. Okay, yeah, so this one is for the first question. Then after that, I'll move on to the second one. Okay, so I'll just clear up what we have here. Now, for the second part, we have a sphere. Maybe I try to zoom in fully. No, I'll just put it here. Now, for the second question, we have a sphere that is attached by a metal wire to the horizontal surface at the bottom of a river, as shown in the figure. The sphere is fully submerged and is in equilibrium, and the wire is at an angle of 68 degrees to the horizontal surface. The weight of the sphere is 32 Newton. The upthrust acting on the sphere is 218 Newton. The density of water is 1 times 10 power 3 kg per meter cube. Assume that the force on the sphere due to the water flow is in the horizontal direction. And then by considering the components of force in the vertical direction, determine the tension in the wire. Okay. So one of the key few, few keywords that you need to identify here was that we know that the sphere is in equilibrium. This is keyword number one. Okay. And then after that, they mentioned that there's a force acting on the sphere due to water flow that is in the horizontal direction. Okay. So this thing is in equilibrium and there are a number of forces acting on it right now. Now, the part A here is mentioning that the components of the force by considering the components of force in vertical direction, find out the tension in the wire, all right? Now you just look at the sphere itself, there are actually a number of forces acting on it. The first one would be the weight W acting on the wire, so acting on the sphere, sorry. And then after that, there's also up thrust acting on the sphere because it's fully submerged. You have weight, you have up thrust. And then after that, you also have tension of the wire acting on the sphere, which is in this particular direction. Okay. It is following the, it's along the wire. Okay, it's, fall, it's following the same path as the wire. Okay, the tension T here, All right? It's in the same direction as the wire. This one, you can see that there's a zigzag here. Okay, wait, let me just highlight it. There's a zigzag here. So what you learned last time in maths was that if this is 68 degrees here, this one would be 68 degrees too. 
okay because of the zigzag all right so if this one is 68 degrees you can now try to resolve the tension okay so let me just rewrite this so that it's clearer this is 68 degrees this is tension t now the tension t you can actually resolve it into two perpendicular components the first one could be the horizontal direction like this. This one will be T cos 68. Why is it cos? It's because it's adjacent to your angle. And then the last one will be the vertical one, right? So the vertical one is actually going to be a sine. This one will be T sine 68 degrees. Okay. So that is the force components of your tension. And you by right also still have the force on the sphere due to water flow. Let's call it just F. Because your sphere is moving towards the right, it seems to be pushed towards the right. You can assume that the force is towards the right. Okay, so these are all your forces. But your question is just asking you to consider vertical direction of forces. That would mean you only really need to consider U, W, and T sine 68. Okay. So in my case, I know that because the object is in equilibrium, that would mean that sum of vertical forces is zero, which in turn means upward force is equal to downward force, okay? So upward force is actually just going to be U, downward force will be W plus T, sine 68 so the up thrust is already known as 280 the weight is also already known as 32 so from here i already can find out what is my tension t so it will be 280 minus 32 divided by sine 68 giving you 267 newtons okay so this should have been the answer for your case here. Okay, the marking scheme put it at 2SF giving you 270 Newton. It's the same thing. Okay. Then after that, if you look at the subsequent part of your questions for the sphere, okay, this one they are asking you for the sphere, calculate the volume. Okay. Calculate the volume of the sphere. Now this one, you can actually make use of something that you've learned before. Now, up thrust is actually the weight of liquid displaced. By right, it's actually supposed to be weight of fluid displaced now. Okay, but more specifically, usually in your exam question is liquid, so it's correct to say weight of liquid displaced. So if after is this weight of liquid displaced, it will be rho v g. U is rho v g. Now this v is the volume of liquid displaced but it's also the volume of the submerged object. Okay, it's also correct to say it's the volume of the submerged object, okay? So you can find that V alone, that one will really be the volume of liquid displaced, it's also the volume of your submerged object. So right now your submerged object is your sphere, and you're given the value for your up thrust right over here. You try to make use of this equation now, rho Vg equals to U, so u is rho vg it will actually be 280 rho here is the density of your water is the liquid that has been displaced here so 1 times 10 power 3 times v times 9.81 your v would thus be 280 divided by 10 power 3 divided by 9.81 giving you 0 0.0285 meter cube. 
Okay, so let's check whether that's correct. Yeah, rounded up to two SF will just be 0 0.029 meter cube. Okay, so part two after that is asking you to find out the density. Okay, the density that they're talking about here is the density of the sphere, okay? Not the density of your liquid. The density of the liquid is already given to, to you. What they want is the density of your sphere, okay? So to find out the density of your sphere, what will you use to find the density of your sphere? You would use this one. Now, density is mass per unit volume, right? Okay. You know already what is the mass of your sphere. It's not given directly, but you know the weight. From the weight, you can find out the mass. And then you just found out the volume of your sphere. So you know the mass and volume, you can actually find out the density. Okay. So this one, M, you can get from W equals to MG. Okay. So this one, the V was actually from the question answered. All right. So right now, I want to find out the density, right? So I'll just write the working on the right hand side here. So my density is going to be mass over volume. It's going to be weight over gravitational acceleration divided by volume. So my weight was 32 divided by 9.81 divided by 0 0.0285. 32 divided by 9 uh, divided by 9.81 divided by 0 0.0285 you are going to get the answer as 114 kg per meter cube let's check whether the answer is correct yeah it's correct okay at 2 sf it will be 110 kg per meter cube okay so this is pretty straightforward Okay, then after that, I move on to the next part in the next page. Now, here they mention this. The center of the sphere is initially at a height of 6.2 meter above the horizontal surface. The speed of the water then increases, causing the sphere to move in a different to a different position. The movement of the sphere causes the gravitational potential energy to decrease by 77 joules, okay? Your GPE is decreasing by 77 joules. Now, what would be the final height of the center of the sphere above the horizontal surface? So it will probably be a good idea to try and draw out the diagram. So your sphere was originally somewhere here. And then it's attached to the horizontal surface by your cable. So this was the initial case. They told you that at this position, your height above the horizontal surface was 6.2 meter. Okay, but then after that, your speed of water increased, causing your sphere to move to a new position and your gravitational potential energy subsequently decreased by 77 joules. Okay, so the fact that your gravitational potential energy decreases, this one actually tells you that there is a decrease in height. Okay, because GPE has dropped, okay? So now your sphere position would probably be somewhere around here. This would be the new position of your sphere. Okay, let me just use a different color. This would be the new position of your sphere somewhere around here. Okay. So what you're interested to find out is the new height of the sphere above the horizontal surface. In your case, what you're interested in finding out is this one what is this new height okay 
So what did they what did they mention was that from here to here, from this position to this position, your change in GPE was actually 77 joules. Okay. Now there's something that you can actually find from here. Your delta H. If you look at the diagram here, this one would actually be your delta H, your change in height. You went from here to here, right? So we know that your change in GPE was 77 joules. Okay. So from there, you can actually work out what is your delta H. So let's write it here. Your change in GPE is actually mg delta H. The value of your GPE change was 77 joules. Your mass is not directly given. You have to direct, uh, find it out if you wanted to. But what they did give you in the question was the weight. You see, the weight of the sphere is 32 Newton. That is already your mg. Okay. Okay. So this would be 72. Okay. Sorry, 32, not 72. They give you your weight already. You don't need to separately multiply the mass and the gravitational acceleration because M and G together is really the weight. So this one would be 32 delta H. Okay, so delta H will be 77 divided by 32, giving you 2.41 meter. Okay, now 2.41 meter is not the final answer. It's just giving you your delta H. What we want is the height above the horizontal surface. So what you do here is this. Therefore, your H is going to be 6.2 minus of 2.41. Okay, The change in height is 2.41 meter. Your original height is 6.2. You want to get the new height. You take 6.2 minus 2.41, you will get 3.79 meter. Okay. So this is your new height. Let's check the height. Yeah. If you run it up to 2 SF, it's going to be 3.8. Okay. That's how you do this particular question. Okay, then after that, you move on to part D. Now for part D, they mentioned that the extension of the wire increases when the sphere changes position as described in C. The wire is obeying Hooke's law. State a simple equation that gives the relationship between tension T in the wire and extension X. Identify any symbols that you use. Okay. So what they basically just mentioned to you here is that your wire extended when your sphere changed position and the wire obeys Hooke's law. So when you're talking about Hooke's law, Hooke's law is actually F is equals to Kx, okay? So you, you are supposed to apply in your current case. They tell you, Find state a simple equation that gives you the relationship between tension T in the wire and the extension X. Identify any symbol that you use. So you will, if you were to go and adapt Hooke's law to your current question, it should be T equals to Kx. The force is the tension. Okay, the extension is still X here. All right. The new variable that you have that is not stated within the question itself is this. This one is actually your spring constant or force constant. They just say T is equal to Kx where K is a constant. Okay, now you can probably just call this your spring constant, okay? So T is equal to Kx where K is spring constant. Okay, the question doesn't require you to write it as spring constant. You just write it as constant, it will be fine. Okay, no issues here. Now, there's also another way to find out the relationship between the tension T and the extension X. This one is through another different equation. 
This one, I'll show it on the right hand side here. If you remember the definition of Young's modulus E is equals to stress over strain, and then our stress is force over area, strain is extension over the original length. So if you rearrange this, E would be FL over AX. And then after that, if you further rearrange this, F would actually be EA over L times X, okay? F is actually EA over L times with X, okay? If you adapt it to your question, the F was actually supposed to be your T. All right, same like your current case here. F is actually your T. So your equation here, you could have just written it as, this is actually a more complicated way of doing it. You can actually written it as T equals to EA over L times X. But then after that, you will need to state what symbols did you use. So here T is already stated in your question. X is already stated inside your question. The only other symbols that are not stated is E, A, and L. So for your case, if you want to use this, you have to say that where E is young modulus, a is cross sectional area and L is the unextended length, the original length. Okay. This is the unextended length. Okay. You can also have written it as this. But this is actually very, very tedious to write. All right? You can say there's the original or unstretched name. Yeah, there's other term to do this. You can either say it's unextended length or you can either say it's original or unstretched length. Okay? Either one would do. Okay, now for part two, they mentioned this. Before the sphere change position, the initial elastic potential energy, the EP of the wire was 0 0.65 joules. The change in position of the sphere caused the extension of the wire to double. Okay, the extension of your wire has actually doubled when you go and change your position. From here, calculate the final elastic potential energy of the wire after the sphere has changed position. What is the new value of the EPE after you have changed position here? Okay, now when you're talking about EPE, this one you can actually just make use of one of the equation. We know that EPE is either half Fx or half kx squared, all right? So there's two different equations here that we can use. It's either half fx or half kx squared. But in our case, it will actually be better to use the second one rather than the first one. Because the thing here is that both of these will change together. If you remember the graph of force versus extension for Hooke's law, whenever your extension changes, if let's just say it was at x1, your force will be at f1. If your extension changed to say x2, your force will change to f2. So that's what I meant by the first equation. If you try to use this one, it's actually a bit 
tedious because when you exchange your exchange, you have to consider two different changes together. But the second equation, EP is equals to half kx squared. There's one thing that's convenient about this equation. That one is that k, the spin constant, remains constant regardless of the extension of force. Okay, this one remains constant regardless of the force and extension. Okay, right. So here, EPE being half kx squared, only x can change, only x is changing, but k remains fixed, it's constant. So that's the reason why we want to use this equation specifically because there's less things to consider, in other words. So if EPE is actually half kx squared, k being constant, it would mean that EPE is proportional to x squared, okay? So in our case, EPE is proportional to x squared. This would mean that EPE2 to EPE1 is x2 square over x1 square. All right. So, but the thing here was that it told us that the extension of the wire is double. This one already tells us that x2 is actually two times of x1. Okay. So here I can actually just say that EPE2 over EPE1 was 0 0.65 equals to 2x1 square over x1 square. I don't need to know what is the original extension. Okay, I don't need to know what is x1 because here you will eventually see that they cancel each other off. Okay, so my final answer of EPE2 will actually be 0 0.65 times with 4. Okay, your square here will apply to the x1, it will also apply to the 2 here. Okay, so x1, you square it, it will cancel off with the bottom term. So leaving you with 4 only. Then after that, you bring the 0 0.65 over, you will get 0 0.65 times 4. So 0.65 times 4 will give you 2.6 joules. Okay, so this one will be your answer for the EPE, all right, it will be 2.6 joules. There's actually a shortcut here that you can probably use if you already see this one here. Now this one here, if EPE is directly proportional to x squared, if your x is increased by two times because here they told you your extension of y is double, that would mean that your EPE is quadrupled it will increase by four times because two times, two square becomes four, right? So just by looking at this relation, relation EPE proportional to X square, when X increase by two times, your EPE will increase by four times because you're thinking two and you're squaring it. So your, extension, your EPE now becomes four times more. So here you can actually then say that therefore EPE is now four, EPE2 is four times of the original value, four times 0 0.65, giving you 2.6, okay? It's the same thing, okay? All right, so if this one is okay, then I move on to the next subsequent question. Uh, for question three, it was mentioned that a man is standing on a wall and he throws a small wall, a small ball, particularly upwards with a velocity of 5.6 meter per second. The ball leaves his hand when it's at a height of 3.1 meter above the ground. Okay, so that guy is standing on the wall. He's throwing a ball upwards when the ball was at a height of 3.1 meter above the ground. Now, assume that air resistance is negligible here. So this part here, which tells you air resistance is negligible, would have told you a very important thing that weight is the 
only force acting. Therefore, your acceleration would always be G. Okay. Now, show that the ball reaches a maximum height above the ground of 4.7 meter. Okay. So the keyword here is that you need to show that your ball reached a maximum height 4.7 meter above the ground. Okay. The question, the keyword here is above the ground, not from starting point. Okay. Not from point of release. Okay. You're not talking about the maximum height from point of release. You're talking about from the ground. So to make it clearer for you, what I mean by that, this one here is your point of release. This part here is the ground. Okay. So we would know that when we throw the ball, it will go up. It will probably be better if I just draw a diagram. So the person is standing right over here. He's throwing the ball upwards. Let's call this ball, this little round thing here. He's throwing the ball upwards at a speed of 5.6 meter per second. So in our case, the ball will travel up in this manner. It goes up, reaches the maximum height before falling all the way back down. Okay, so this is our max height where v is supposed to be zero. Okay, so we want the maximum height above the ground. That is actually asking us to find this. Yeah, let me just draw a line here. That is asking us to find this particular distance here. Maybe I'll choose a suitable color. We are finding this particular height right over here. Okay. But to do that, we need to first find out our maximum height from the point of release first. Now, so here, let me just draw this. This is the point of release. We want to find out what is this S. Okay, this one is representing our maximum height. Okay, this is the maximum height from point of release. So here we can just straight away apply your kinematics equation. Now we know kinematics would have V equals to U plus AT. S is equals to half U plus V times T. S is equals to UT plus half AT square. And then V square is equals to U square plus 2AS. All right. But let's consider what are the few things we know here. We already know that U is 5.6. V is 0. A is equals to G. And then after that, time is unknown when it comes to reaching the maximum height. The distance to maximum height is also unknown. So there are actually two unknowns here. So the, which equation should we use? The easy way to look at it would be to find out which is the unwanted variable. Time t to maximum height is unknown, but it's not something we want to find out. Okay, the Distance to maximum height is unknown, but it is something we want to find out. Okay, so if you look at time being an unwanted variable here, since t is the unwanted variable, you can easily eliminate off any of the kinematics equation that has t inside. So you won't need to use the first one, the second one, nor the third equation because they have t inside you are not even bothered to find t here because you don't want to know what it is. The question doesn't want to, you to find that out. Instead, they want you to find out what is the displacement. Okay, So in your case, you will only use the form equation here. 
So your sign convention is upwards positive since your initial direction of motion is upwards. You will get V square equals to U square plus 2AS. This will be zero. This one will be 5.6 square plus two times with negative 9.81. Okay, because your gravitational acceleration is always acting downwards. It is opposite to your sign convention here. Okay, then after that, you would have your S here. So your S is actually the distance to maximum height from point of release, okay? It's 5.6 squared divided by 2 divided by 9.81. You will get the answer as 1.60 meter, okay? So in your case, they want the height from the ground, right? At the point of release, they've already told you what was the height above the ground. Right over here, they've already mentioned that from the ground to the point of release, it was 3.1 meter. So to find this H right over here, your H would actually just be 3.1 plus with 1.6, giving you 4.7 meter okay all right so your final answer here is h equals to 3.1 plus 1.6 giving you 4.7 meter then after that for part b the man does not catch the ball as it falls calculate the time taken for the ball to fall from its maximum height to the ground okay so in your case, they want you to find out the time taken for the ball to fall from its maximum height to the ground. Okay, this time is from max height to the ground. Now for the case where it's falling from maximum height to the ground, this time you are considering a very specific motion in this manner. Okay, this time you will be considering a very specific motion coming down like this. Okay, maybe it's just better if I do this. Just for maximum height to the ground, okay? Now, in your case, if you again want to apply kinematics equation, you won't apply it for the motion from point of release, going up, and then going down. You won't apply it in this manner. You will just straight away apply it from the, point, uh, from the maximum height going all the way to the ground like this. So in your case here, you will have your initial velocity u being zero here, your final velocity v here being unknown, and then your h here is actually going to be your new s. We already found it out as 4.7 meter just now. Okay. So what are the things that you still do not know? You do not know the time only, right? The time t is what you do not know. So in your case, you have two unknowns here, the final velocity on hitting the ground here, but this is not something that you want to find out. The time that it took for you to go from maximum height to the ground was what you want to find out. So you want to apply your kinematics equation here. If you look at the equations on the right-hand side again, just now I mentioned to you, you just eliminate off any of the equation with the unwanted variable, which is the V here. So here, if you look at the kinematics equation, the first equation is out, second equation is out, fourth equation is also out because they have V inside. That leaves you with only the third equation. So you will be using the third equation here to solve and find T. So in your case, now, this one you need to be careful now because you're considering motion from maximum height all the way towards the ground. Your direction of motion, your initial direction of motion is now downwards. Okay, this is your initial direction of motion now because you're considering from maximum height to the ground. So this time, downwards is considered to be positive for you. Downward is now considered to be positive for you. So you use S is equals to UT plus half AT square. 
your S will now be 4.7. Your U is actually 0 plus half. Now, because your acceleration now is downwards and is in the same direction as your sign convention, now this time it will be plus 9.81. There will be no negative sign here. Okay. Then other than that, just multiply this with T square. You will eventually get T as some value. 4.7 times 2 divided by 9.81 square root of the answer. You will get the answer is 0 0.98 seconds, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, you will get the answer is 0 0.98 seconds. All right. Okay, so this one is okay. Then you move on to the next part. Okay, so for your case in part C, you're supposed to draw a graph. Okay, you're supposed to draw a graph from here. This particular part here mentions this. Just give me a moment while I wrap off all the unnecessary things. Okay, so your t here was found to be 0 0.98 seconds. Just let me write it in, 0 0.98 seconds. Okay, now for part C, the ball leaves the man's hand at time t equals to 0 and then hits the ground at time t equals to capital T. On the figure below, sketch a graph to show the variation of the velocity v of the ball with time t from 0 to capital T. Numerical values of V and T are not required. Assume that V is positive in the upwards direction. Okay, so here they actually kind of define for you your sign convention. What direction is assumed to be positive here? Upwards is already considered to be positive here for your case. So if you want to draw a graph of V versus T right now. Now, if you had drawn your graph, you need to be careful a bit about how about whether it's going to be symmetrical or not you consider this if you are talking about your object the ball here being released at time t equals to zero that is actually this point here okay and this one here would be t equals to zero Okay, at 5.6, you release the ball at 5.6 meter per second. Then it goes all the way up, it reaches maximum height, and then it starts to fall down, right? So when it falls down and hits the ground, it will hit the ground at t equals to 0 0.9 second. But this one in your question is really defined as capital T. Okay, so the thing that I just want you to be aware of here is this. When your object went up at 5.6 meters per second, it reached maximum height, then it went down to a value of zero, and then it started to go back all the way down. When it reached back the same point of release, which was right over here, your velocity of your object, let me just redraw it here, the velocity of your object, at the point at the same height of release, this one would be 5.6 meter per second, also, just that it's in opposite direction. Okay, so when you went up, it was 5.6 meter per second, but then after that, when you go back down, when you reach back that same height of release right over here, the speed of your ball would just be 5.6 meter per second. Okay, then after that, because you did not catch the ball, the ball continued to speed towards the ground. Its speed will continue to increase. So at this point here, when it hit the ground, the speed must be more than 5.6 meter per second because it is allowed to speed up more, okay? If only you caught it at the same point of release, then your speed will actually have been the same, 
but because you did not catch the ball, the ball was still allowed to speed up to the ground. The speed on hitting the ground will actually be more than 5.6 meter per second. Okay, so when you draw your graph, you cannot draw a graph that is symmetrical. What I mean by that is something like this. See, this is your graph of say B versus T. B versus T. And then this is the capital T, the point where you hit the ground. You cannot draw your graph being symmetrical in this manner. It cannot be symmetrical where you say that if this one is some value of 5.6, this one is negative 5.6. And then it let's say that this one is maybe in your case uh, some value of some random value. Let's just say I tell you it's two seconds. This one is also two seconds. This is what I mean by the graph cannot be symmetrical. Okay, it cannot be symmetrical. I mean to say this point and this point are the same, just opposite direction. And then this time here and this time here are the same. No, cannot. Because you can clearly see that if I try to do this thing again for you, this one is the time going up, right? From here all the way to here. And then this one is the time going down, right? From here to here. Time going down would be more than time going up. All right. Yeah, I think this one is better if I just change this to time going up and time going down. If you say that time going up is the same as time going down, this is wrong, okay? cannot be symmetrical. That's what I meant by that. So when you want to draw your graph now, you want to draw it in this manner. Something like this would do. Okay. You can see from here, in terms of the values now, this one is actually 10 boxes, but this one is actually 15 boxes okay just like i told you that your speed on hitting the ground must be more than at the point of release right so at the point of release your speed was maybe at 10 boxes value but now on hitting the ground it must be more so it could be at 15 boxes maybe and then after that you look at the time going up and the time going down this one represents the time going up Whereas this one represents the time going down. So you can clearly see from here that time going down is more than time going up. So this is the correct one. It is showing to you that you actually spend more time going down than you going up. Okay, so this will be the correct graph. And also another thing, how do you even know that it's going to be a straight line graph like this is because V is, sorry, A is actually rate of change of velocity. Okay. A is rate of change of velocity. Just now I mentioned to you, you have constant acceleration because you have no air resistance, right? So you have constant acceleration, therefore constant gradient of bt graph okay so this is one thing to note acceleration is real change of velocity is actually the gradient of your bt graph so it will be a straight line and you will be having negative gradient why negative gradient in the first place because they already told you positive in the upward direction v is positive in the upward direction so because you projected your object upwards in the first place, it will start with positive value first. And then after that, when you went down, it will be negative value. Okay, so that's for this one. If you want to see how the marking scheme worded it, they basically, I'll put it as this. Line drawn from non-zero speed at zero to a greater speed at t. A single 
sloping straight line drawn from 0 to t. Line starts with a positive non-zero value of v and then it ends with a negative non-zero value of v. Okay, so that's what they are looking for. And it's about three marks. Now for part D, they're asking you what is represented by the gradient of your graph in C. So just now I actually kind of mentioned that to you already. The gradient of your VT graph is actually your acceleration. Okay, so this is representing acceleration. So far so good. Then for part E, they mentioned that the man now throws a second ball with the same velocity from the same height as the ball. The mass of the second ball is greater than that of the first ball. Assume that air resistance is still negligible. Okay, so what are the changes that have been made here is that for the second ball, it was still at the same velocity and at the same height of release. The only difference now is that the mass of the ball is greater than that of the first ball, okay? And also assume that air resistance is still negligible. So now they want you to compare the magnitudes of the acceleration and the speeds with which they hit the ground. Okay, now this one actually doesn't require much thinking if you know the concept, but just give me a moment while I rub off some of the stuff here. Now, last time I would have mentioned in one of my recorded lessons, maybe I did not mention it directly in your class. I mentioned this before. Let me just write it out in yellow. For any object moving through or moving or falling through the air, for any object that's moving or falling through the air, if the only force acting is just the weight, then is acceleration will always be G, okay? So whenever you have any object moving or falling through the air, if you see that the only force acting is really just the weight, no air resistance, no uptrust, no other external force, this acceleration will only be equal to G, okay? A will be equals to G. Now, this is regardless of their masses and weight. Now, why do I say this? Why is it that I say that the acceleration will just be equals to G regardless of the mass and weight? This one, I will just show you a very simple example here. You consider this one here. If I had two objects that were released from the same height, uh, from the same height here, like this, I had the first object that is 1 kg. I have a second object that is 100 kg. Okay, so let's call this object as having weight W1, which is equals to M1G. And then let's call this object as having a weight of W2 equals to M2G. Okay, so I release both of these objects with different masses at the same level. Here I tell you no air resistance, okay? All right. So no air resistance is coming into play here. You know that the first object will fall down to the ground. So will the second object fall down to the ground, okay? Now, if I ask you to apply F net equals to MA for the first object, your net force is actually your weight, which is W1. And then applying MA here, this one will be M1A. 
but W1 is M1G. So you see M1G is equals to M1A. The masses will actually cancel each other off, giving you A is equals to G. Now I can likewise repeat the analysis for the second object where I say F net is equals to MA. So here the net force is just the weight, which in your case is W2 equals to M2A. But W2 again, you know, is M2G, right? So M2G equals to M2A. You again will see that the masses will tend to cancel each other off, giving you again A equals to G. Okay, that's why here I can say that if you see that the only force acting is really just the weight, your acceleration will always be equal to G. It doesn't matter whether the masses is larger or smaller or whatnot, it will just always be equal to G. Okay, so now if you look at your current question, where they tell you they are throwing a second ball at the same release speed of 5.6 at the same height of 3.1 meter above the ground, what will happen to the magnitude of the acceleration? What will happen to the speed at which they hit the ground? In your case, you notice that for first part, when they're asking you about the magnitude of the acceleration, because air resistance is still negligible, weight is still the only force acting. Therefore, A is still equals to G. So in terms of the magnitude of your accelerations here, it's actually unchanged. It's actually same or unchanged or equal to before. Okay, anyone, right? Before this, your acceleration was equals to G, right? Now it's still equals to G because the weight is still the only force acting right over here. All right. Now, you then if you move on to number two, which asks you the speed with which your object hits the ground, which is basically look, talking about this part here. Okay. So do you expect the speed to be any different? Now, you just consider this. Your object was having same initial speed. Same initial speed. Same release height. And then plus same acceleration. Okay. So all this has already been determined. Same initial speed, same release height, same, same acceleration. So when your object goes up and then falls back down, you would expect that the speed is the same on hitting the ground. Okay, because the condition actually didn't change compared to the first case. All right. So your answer here would actually be the same as the first one. No? Speeds are equal or same. No? So here you can actually just say same, unchanged, or equal again. All right. So that's how you would do this particular question. All right. Okay, so if this one is okay, then I move on to the fourth one. This one is on momentum. Okay, so the one on momentum, this one will be pretty straightforward. This is 2D momentum. Okay, the question here is on 2D momentum. All right. Now for question four, state the principle of conservation of momentum. This one is something that you would have learned from your definitions. Okay. So when it comes to principle of conservation of momentum, you will probably say something like this, one of these two definitions. Now. Total momentum before collision is equal to total momentum after collision for a closed system. So notice that they gave you two marks here, right? 
you just say total momentum before collision is equal to total momentum after collision, this is one mark. You need to add on another phrase. Total momentum before collision is equal to total momentum after collision for a closed system. So you add this phrase for a closed system. This is where your other mark comes from. Okay. So it's pretty important to write for a closed system. And also another thing I should mention to you, you must always say total momentum before equals to total momentum after. If you don't write the word total, you just say momentum before collision is equals to momentum after collision, automatically it will be marked as wrong. You need to have the word total momentum before collision equals to total momentum after collision for a closed system. Okay. Now, sometimes the variation of the answer can be slightly different where they tell you instead of saying that it's for a closed system, you say there are no external force acting. Meaning you say if you want to rewrite the definition, you can just write sum of momentum before collision is equals to sum of momentum after collision is no resultant external force acts on the system. Okay, that's another different way of wording it. Closed system here means no external force acting. This one here, when we say closed system, this one means no external force acting on system. That's why it's called closed, because no external force acts on the system. All right. Now, if you move on to part B, two balls X and Y move along a horizontal frictional surface as shown from above here. Ball X has mass 3 kg and a velocity of 4 meters per second in the direction and angle theta to line AB. Ball Y has mass 2.5 kg and a velocity of 4.8 meters per second in the direction and angle theta to line AB. The two balls collide and stick together. After colliding, the balls have a velocity of 3.7 meters per second along the line AB on the horizontal surface. Now, by considering the components of momenta along line AB, calculate theta. Okay. Now, the word momenta here is actually the same as momentum. Momenta is just the plural form of momentum, okay? So when they say consider the momentum along line AB, this is actually asking you to consider in the horizontal direction, okay? Now, before we go to that, you look at your diagram, you need to try and resolve your velocities so that you can get the corresponding momentum. If you look at the case before collision, let's have a look at this one before collision. Maybe I zoom it out. Okay, let me just clear out the right things here, okay? And zoom things in, okay? Okay, so if we look at this particular case here, I want to resolve the velocities first so that I can get the corresponding momentum. Now you see, if I draw a line like this, you notice that there's a zigzag here, right? If this is angle theta here, this one will be angle theta here also. The same could be said for the one above. If I draw a horizontal line here, you again will notice there's a zigzag here. If this is angle theta, this one would have been angle theta too. Okay. So these are your particular angles here, all right? So from here, you can actually start to resolve your velocities. In my case, this one could have been resolved to 4.8 cos theta. This one would be 4.8 sine theta because I'm resolving the velocities here, all right? And then this one here, for the horizontal part, it will be 4 cos theta. The other one will be 4 sine theta. Okay, this one will be 4 sine theta. Right, this is you already resolving the velocities. So from here, do you want to consider the momentum along line AB along the horizontal direction? What you can probably then do from here is this. You probably don't need to write the first line. Uh. This is me just doing it out of habit. 
the initial momentum in the x direction is the same as the final momentum in the x direction. So second line onwards, if you want to write, it will be something like this. Because you're considering the horizontal momentum, you are only considering this velocities. Okay, you multiply with the mass to get the corresponding momentum. So this one, in your case, it will be three times. Okay, it's better if I use a darker color here. This one will be three times four cos star plus with 2.5 times 4.8 cos theta. Okay, your direction is assumed to be positive in the right direction. Okay, going rightwards is your positive direction. Okay, so here you are always going towards the right, so there's no negative to consider. Then after that, after the collision, it's just going to be the two masses added together because they stick together. This one will be 3 plus 2.5 times with 3.7 okay so you try to solve this what will you get uh 2.5 times 4.8 plus with 3 times 4 you're actually going to get 24 cos theta equals to 5.5 times 3.7 this one is 20.35 so 20.35 divided by 24, of course, of the value, theta would be 32 degrees. Okay. So that is for this particular question. You will get the answer as 32 degrees. Then if you move on to the next page. Okay. The next one is asking you, let me just write something. Let me just clear out the diagram first. Uh, the next thing they'll ask you is this. Just know the angle is 32 degrees, all right? Now, by calculation of the kinetic energy, state and explain whether the collision of the balls is inelastic or perfectly elastic. Okay. So, when it came to the condition of something being elastic, there were two criteria that you will learn in AS. The first one was relative speed of approach equals to relative speed of separation. And then after that, the second one would have been the sum of your initial KE is equals to the sum of your final ke this one is actually just telling you total ke is conserved there is no change in ke before and after collision okay so here the question is really just asking you to consider based on the ke's itself Right, so you want to find out the ke, you just find out the initial ke. You know? Some of initial ke would just be the ke of x here and the ke of y here. So, in my case, if you want to write it out, this one would be half 3 times 4 square plus with half. 2.5 times 4.8 square. If you go and work it out, this one will be 16 times 3 times 0.5 plus 0.5 times 2.5 times 4.8 square. This one will be 52.8 joules. Okay. The next one, you want to find the final KE, right? So this one will be the next one. Your final KE would be just considering these two objects moving together as one. So this one will be half 3 plus 2.5 because you're adding the masses together. So this is 3 plus 2.5 times with 3.7 squared. So 5.5 times 0.5 times 3.7 squared. 
you get the answer is 37.6 joules okay so now if you make the comparison now you will be very clear that the ke's are not the same before and after collision okay so it's definitely not going to be elastic it's definitely not going to be elastic it is an elastic collision okay so what you can probably write as your final answer is probably this total kinetic energy before and after collision is not the same it's not the same therefore collision is inelastic okay so you need to make sure you write this total ke before and after is not the same therefore collision is inelastic all right that's how you would do this particular question okay so the question, the market scheme just say values of EK and final key, EK both correct and inelastic stated. Okay. They didn't really tell you how to write the answer. Okay. So if this one is okay, then we move on to the next one. Question five, I think is waves already. Okay. We still have about 15 minutes here. So I think we can just go through this. I may not be able to finish this wave question maybe just half of it right so now if you look at question five light from a laser is used to produce an interference pattern on the screen as shown in this figure light of wavelength 630 nanometer is incident normally on two slits that have a separation of 0.44 meter sorry 0.44 millimeter the double slit is parallel to the screen and the perpendicular distance between the double slit and the screen is 1.8 meter the central bright fringe on the screen is formed at point O. The next dark fringe below point O is formed at point P. The next bright fringe and the next dark fringe below point P are formed at points Q and R respectively. The first part here says that light waves from the two slits are coherent. What is me meant by coherent? So this one is a term that repeats itself over and over again. When you say coherent, it just means constant phase difference. Okay, that is what coherence actually is. It's just constant phase difference. If you just if you want to be a bit more specific, it's constant phase difference between the waves. Okay, but the statements that are in the round bracket is actually not required to be written now. Okay, now for part B, they then mention for the two light waves superposing an R, calculate the difference in their path lengths in Newton and uh, in nanometer from the slits. Now, when they ask you about the difference in their path lengths, this one is actually asking you about the path difference. Okay, remember difference in the distance traveled by two waves to a particular point is known as your path difference so difference in the path length is actually another way of saying the same thing okay so they are asking you to look at point r for light waves superposing a point r which is right over here what is the path difference from the slits okay so to make it easier for you to see what is the path difference you consider this, let's just call this source S1, let's just call this source S2. When your waves pass through your double slit, wave from S1 will move to point R here like this. And then wave from S2 will also move to point R here like this okay so clearly the distance traveled by s1 and s2 is not the same right so there's a difference in their path so when you're talking about path difference it is kind of referring to this portion here this one 
is their path difference. Okay, so I did explain to you how does path difference play a part in giving you your bright and dark range, in giving you your constructive and destructive interference before in one of the lessons. So to summarize what we did mention last time was that for constructive interference, which gives you your bright fringe, which gives you your bright fringe, your path difference must be zero, lambda, two lambda, three lambda, in other words, n lambda. But if you're talking about destructive interference which gives you dark fringes your path difference would have been 0 0.5 lambda okay, like maybe i just write it in fraction form here for you first it should have been lambda over 2 3 lambda over 2 5 lambda over 2 and so on and so forth Okay, which in turn gave you this now like, n plus half lambda, isn't it? Now another way of interpreting the fractions would be something like this. Because if you change these values from fraction form to a proper number form, this is actually 0 0.5 lambda, 1.5 lambda, 2.5 lambda. You notice it's always 0 0.5, 0 0.5 lambda. Okay, so this is for dark fringes, formation of dark fringes. Point R that you are looking at here is your dark fringe, okay? And notice that they already mentioned to you that O is actually your central fringe. So your center line is actually right over here. This is your center line. Okay, in terms of your path difference, if I want to write it out, If I want to write out your path difference, just give me a moment. If I want to write out your path difference, for the bright fringes, this one will be zero. This one will be lambda for O and Q. But for your dark fringe, this one would have been the first dark fringe would be 0 0.5 lambda. And then the second dark fringe would be 1.5 lambda. Okay. So this would be for your dark fringes. This would be for your bright fringes. Okay. It must follow a certain pattern. Okay. So your path difference at point R is actually going to be 1.5 lambda. So here your path difference is 1.5 lambda. They've already given you your wavelength in nanometer. The answer also wants it in nanometer, so it's 1.5 times 660, giving you 990 nanometer. So this one would be your path difference, okay? Then after that, if you move on to the second part of your question, they want you to find out your phase difference in degrees. Okay, they already given you the units. They want the phase difference in degrees. So I'll write the workings right over here in yellow so your phase difference would actually be 1.5 times 360 okay because one lambda is equivalent to 360 degrees okay one lambda is equivalent to 360 degrees or 2 pi radian because one lambda is one cycle already, isn't it? So 
just now you already know that your phase difference, your path difference, sorry, was 1.5 lambda. So when it comes to phase difference, you just change the lambda to 360. So it's 1.5 times 360. Your phase difference is going to be 540 degrees. This will be the answer for your current question. Okay, 540 degrees. All right. Okay, then after that, we move on to the next page. So this one, I'll just clear everything. Now, calculate the distance OQ here. Look at distance OQ. Distance OQ is this one. Okay. Is from a bright fringe to the next bright fringe. Okay. This one is actually your X. Okay. And also, because you see, you are talking about two slits here. You know that for double slit, because this is two slit, it's automatically a double slit question. The equation that is applicable for double slit would always be lambda is equals to ax over d. So here, when they ask you to find the distance OQ, OQ is actually x itself, okay? Because x from this equation is distance between adjacent bright fringes or dark fringes, okay? It's the same thing. It's either distance between adjacent bright fringes or this distance between adjacent dark fringes. So what I mean by that is that if I look at this dark fringe and dark, this dark fringe, P to R is also considered to be X because it's distance between adjacent dark fringe, all right? So in your case, OQ, you already establish as your X. You really just want to apply this equation and find out what is X here. So here, what we'll do is that we already know the values of the wavelength is 630. So times 10 power minus nine. Your A is the distance between your slits, which they've already given you two slits, have a separation of 0 0.44 millimeter. So this one will be 0 0.44 times 10 power minus three, multiply with X, then divide by your D, which is 1.8 meter, the distance between the double state to your screen. So you divide it by 1.8 and then you solve. So 660 times 10 power minus nine times 1.8, divide by 0.44, divide by 10 power minus three, you will get the distance X as 2.7 times 10 power minus nine meter okay so this one would have been your working here you use lambda is equals to ax over d you go and sub in the values and you get the answer okay so this working here goes through here all right so far so good